welcome to The Career Studio, a USU career services podcast that helps you navigate your career path. Thanks for joining us for our Friday face-to-face episode. I'm Marissa Armistead, your host, and I'm so excited to have Dr. Susan Madsen joining us today. Welcome, Susan. Great to be here. Susan is the inaugural Karen Height Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. She's been heavily involved in women leadership research for decades. Dr. Madsen is considered one of the top global thought leaders on the topic of women and leadership, has authored or edited six books, and has published hundreds of articles, chapters, and reports. Her work has been featured in the U.S. News and World Report, The Atlantic, The New York Times, Parenting Magazine, Chronicle of Higher Education, The Washington Post, and is a regular Forbes contributor. Additionally, she is a much sought after speaker in local, national, and international settings and has facilitated women's leadership development programs and seminars with women leaders from over 40 countries. Susan, I know I am just skimming the surface of your accomplishments here, but I am so excited to have you join us today as we talk about building career confidence. So Susan, as a fun fact, you mentioned that you were raised with six brothers and no sisters. So I'm curious if this upbringing had any influence on your career path. That's a great question. Yes, I do admit I have six <laughs> brothers. So when I, I do so much seeking, Marissa, and, and I have a lead in, if people haven't heard it before, where I say, yeah, some people think that, or ask me, you do all this girls and women's work. Do you not like men? I'm like, actually, I love men. I have three sons. I married to a man. And then some people, this is how I open my speeches. Some people say, well, to do all this girls and women's stuff, you must have been raised with a bunch of sisters. And then I I'll, on my PowerPoint, I'll show a picture of my six brothers and it usually gets a chuckle. But I I have actually, I do a lot of unconscious bias training and a lot of speaking on discrimination, all kinds of things. And some on really understanding who you are and your privilege. And interestingly, I think actually my being raised with six brothers has given me kind of a privilege that other women don't have because I learned from a young age really how to interact with men and and, and I d- didn't have women around, um, my mom, I guess. But um, now I'm in a school of business, many men, many male faculty, a lot of interaction in businesses and different things that are really heavy in terms of leadership, male, right? And I don't shy away from men. I think my brothers really did help me in some of, of those respects. I do need to, to mention that my father, he passed away a couple years ago, but about a year before he passed away, he leaned over on his couch. I still remember this moment. And he said, you do know you were the most aggressive of our children. <laughs> it, it, so I think I always kind of had my voice. Uh, five of my brothers were younger and I babysat and bossed them around. They'll still tell you that. But in terms of your question, great question on did it influence your career path and choices? I think it did in some ways. I was raised really traditionally in the predominant religion here in the state of Utah, but I loved seeing my father's career and what he did and always was kind of in the bo- with the boys in terms of going to college and figuring out majors and all of that. So yeah, I've had, I teach so much about women's leadership and help people understand their path of leadership that I've done a lot of reflection myself. And so I definitely think everything we do leads us to what we choose to do and how we interact and what we do in general in the future. Absolutely. Well, and this past year, Susan, I attended a seminar that you hosted and you brought up this idea of imposter syndrome in the workplace. And it really got the wheels turning for me. I think so many students, probably everybody at some point in their their life feel this. And so I'm curious, at what point did you ever feel this imposter syndrome kind of kick in for you? Were there any particular moments? Well, for, by the way, I mean, it, it really, so generally most people, even men, women feel imposter syndrome more than men. That's the basics. But you still see that with men. And so when you're talking to students in general, you know, those little voices, what is it first? Those that little voice in your mind that says, oh, I feel like a fraud or someone's going to figure out that maybe I'm not smart enough to be in this program or, um, oh, I'll do, you know, something will happen where I'll look stupid and people will really know maybe that's my real side. Those kinds of things are pretty common, but we see those so much in women. So in terms of your question for me, I actually, for me, I've done a lot of reflection. I don't think I have a imposter syndrome as much as other people, but I have 
have it in one thing in my life, which is not necessarily work related, but it's all combined. And that is really being a mother. Isn't that interesting? A good, I'm putting this in quote marks. Yes. A good or ideal mother. What does that look like? In fact, I, I talk about this often in certain settings, religious settings specifically. So I struggled being the typical, I'm putting my hands up again, <laughs> quote marks, the typical, especially Latter-day Saint mom, because she loves to cook and she loves to do crafts and she loves to do all these things. And I never did. And I tried to. So I always, that's the area that I actually felt more of an imposter syndrome in. And when you look at your career, there's always that work-life integration. So things at home actually impact your career. Things at work actually impact your home. So you can't actually separate that all. So if you're thinking about your own career, those of you listening in, your own career, especially women, but this applies to men too, you really need to think about the connection between the two. And we used to call it, and sometimes use people still do, work-life balance, right? I did my dissertation many, many, many years ago on this topic, and, and we just don't call it balance anymore. We call it integration, work-life integration, because balance is like this teeter-totter, right? Like everything has to be equal, but sometimes it's not equal. Sometimes you don't have kids at home. I don't know. I have four kids, but they're not at home. So my, my, it's not a balance. It's an integration and you shift all the time. I love that. And I love that reframe from balance to integration. I think that's so key. And especially I would say as we've moved into this unique world of remote work, I would say it's probably times 10, right? Times a hundred that we're seeing this. It has to be an integration. You can't just put them in boxes and say, this is work and this is home. That They are all combined now. So I think that's such a great perspective as we as we move forward into 2021. And by the way, women are, especially women that, well, women in general are better integrators than men generally. Not every woman, not every man. But uh, one of the research studies that came out this fall is so interesting. It was uh, Qualtrics was, was one of the partners on it. And what they said is when you do have two parents and they're both working at home, women still do most of the unpaid care work, even if they're working full time in the home. But what was interesting is that men said that they were stressed a little bit more, but because they have been able to compartmentalize more when women have actually integrated. Because even if we go and we're in the workplace, we are sending texts, <laughs> we're worrying about things, we're scheduling doctor's appointments, and men have really been able to, not every man, separate those. But now, you know, they're not used to that. So women really do have a gift. You know, sometimes we say, oh, women multi task better than men. Actually, there's some research that really does support that, uh, the differences in our brains and, and some of the things that we learn to do as we're socialized and grow up. And, and I want to stay on this vein of, of women and leadership because this is this is what you do, Susan. This is what you yep. research. This is what you live and breathe. So I'm really curious, how did you come to find yourself studying about women? What Talk us through kind of the path that got you there. So I actually have thought about this recently this past year and I've talked about it a couple of times. So so actually, you know, I back in my master's work, was, which was almost 30 years ago, I actually did a master's in exercise physiology and wellness. And I really felt pulled at that point to doing more work on women. I had started teaching exercise. And of course, a lot of times you're just teaching women. So actually in my master's degree at Portland State University many years ago, I my thesis was on pregnancy and exercise. But every class I had, I did a a research paper on a topic of like if it was nutrition, PMS management through exercise and nutrition, osteoporosis for women, stress management issues for women. So I really felt pulled in that direction. So I've been really on that topic and looking at research for a long time. In my master's work, I really did look at wellness, but you know, your mental, your physical, your, and then really in my doctoral work, I looked at leadership development and all kinds of things about making people
people better. But in at the University of Minnesota in my doctorate degree, I actually was the only student in the program that had a bunch of kids. So they asked me to teach the work and family relationships class for the University of Minnesota. So that really took me down the road of studying telecommuting and work and family conflict and programs that companies can utilize to really family friendly policies and those things. And then I really shifted into leadership development probably 15, well, more than 15 years ago. And part of that, just I love development. My master, my doctorate degree is in human resource development, which is four things, career development, training and development, organization development, and leadership development. So, but the women's piece has just been calling my name. I was raised with all these brothers, but I'll tell you through the last years and especially in the last decade, I feel absolutely called to do this work. And I use the word call very intentionally. I do. I have written and done some research on calling and calling can be from God or a higher power. I've spoken in Athens, Greece to business leaders who are not religious at all, but feel this pull towards meaning, like they're made to do certain things. And so that could be a call too. For me, I'm religious. So, and and spiritual, I should say both of those. And and I feel called to study and talk and speak about women's leadership. And for me, it's from God. I love that you're sharing different aspects of yourself. You know, there's family, um, potentially there's a religious aspect, there's educational. And, and so I love that you're taking this holistic approach to how you've kind of gotten to the point where you're at. Another thing I, I was really curious about. So in a recent LinkedIn article, you wrote about the importance of female role models and stated that the research findings suggest that exposing young women to a successful female role model not only provides information about the field, but inspires them to seek out information through taking additional courses or choosing a major um, in that particular subject. So I'm curious, as we're talking about career confidence, how do you think female role models play a part in building women's career confidence? Well, first of all, you, I love that question. I, first of all, if you don't see any women in your, the field that you're thinking you want to go into, or the field that you're in, it's really hard to stay in that field. And what we, what we call, I, I study the leadership element more, but we call it leadership identity. But even without leadership, just being an identity with a certain field, like you can't even see yourself as a woman in that field. And how would it work if you're not seeing other women in that field? So when you do see a role model, and role models can mean different things, Marissa, as you know, sometimes role models can be people you never even even talk to. You just see them and those are important role models. However, you know, you need a combination. So actually getting some time to talk even for 10 or 15 minutes to a woman that could be a role model, but just to get a little bit of more connection with her helps you see yourself, your potential or your future self a little bit better. So if you don't aspire to do something, you're not going to do it. If you don't aspire to go to college and graduate, you're not going to graduate. If you don't aspire to be a woman in a business field, maybe let's say technology, you're really not going to, for the most part, do that. So the more that you can think about, have that identity, and the more you can actually increase your aspirations. And can I just say, Marissa, that oftentimes I find it specifically in Utah, so many of the, the women students really don't even see themselves having a career, even though they're graduating, you know, going towards graduating. But I will tell you that, um, and this is good for men to hear as well, right? That a career can look so different for everybody. And a career can be, like, I didn't realize I was actually through the years keeping up my career, even though I didn't work full time. And I would just teach an evening class once a week, or I would be on a board in the community. And I, or I did this and that. And then I'm thinking back and every piece of that, even if I wasn't working for pay, you know, I was doing community stuff. All of that was part of my career. So my education has helped me in my community work, in being a mother, in my church work. And in church work for me, actually, I, I started and ran a whole family history center with 40 workers. Now, is that not a small business? <laughs> I learned a lot from doing that and I didn't get paid a cent except for blessings from heaven, maybe. But all of those things were part 
part of my career. So we've found in Utah, Marissa, that there's a really, really strong either or mentality. So either I can do this or I can do this. If I have a kids, then I can't finish college. If I have kids, then I can't. I'm not having a career at all. Ah, that's the the mentality should be and. So you can do this and you can do a master's degree part time. You can, you know, do run for public office and still have a baby. (laughs) So I would tell your listeners to shake things up a little bit on their mentality and not just for women, but men too, you know, because a lot of great men have spouses and are great influencers on whether women finish degrees on whether women, you know, decide to use those degrees in in for pay, part-time, full-time, whatever it looks like. We just need to shake things up and do things the the way that we feel guided, whatever that guiding means for every every person. Um, so anyway, you didn't ask me that question, Marissa, but I gave it to you anyway. No, I love it. Well, and I, what I love so much is is you're bringing up this aspect of culture, right? We're all growing up in different cultures. We all have different backgrounds. And those 100% affect um, the way we view careers, the way we view work, even on a very simple level. You know, what does work mean to one person uh, means a very different thing to another person. And so I, I love that you're you're shaking things up. You're, you're thinking about it in a different way and asking yourself, you know, what are the possibilities rather than here? is what I'm confined to. And I think that's really empowering. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Oh, thank, thanks. One, just with tagging off what you just said, the research is quite clear that men and women often, not always, look at the word success differently and ambition differently. So oftentimes men really, when they hear that word, they think of a straight up, my hands are going straight up like a ladder. So the success means I'm going up the ladder, you know, step by step. For women, the research has found that they're just as ambitious or they have this idea of what success is just as much as men, but theirs is more integrated. So they want to go up that career ladder, but if it's all about that career ladder, it's not that satisfying and meaningful. So I do up and out with my hands, meaning, yes, career advancement, and also I want to be a good mom or and or I want to be involved in the community. I want to do something with politics, you know, that whole kind of more of an integrated. <laughs> We're using that word a lot today. No, it's a great word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and OK, so I'm going to go back. I'm backtracking here a little bit because there is one question I really did want to kind of dive into. I'd love to hear about a meaningful mentor to you, especially as we're talking about, OK, I have some of these cultural, we'll call them cultural influence. Influences. I also have some of these like personal desires that I'm trying to figure out, you know, career wise. So how did you find a meaningful mentor who both understood or, or maybe they were just different mentors, but how did you find mentors who both had, you know, some of the same cultural or, you know, religious, some of the same beliefs there, but then also understood this desire to maybe shake things up and do different things. So how did you find a mentor who kind of fit both of those? So I I actually speak a lot on the difference between mentor or coach or role model, and there's a a big difference. I would say I didn't have a mentor that did that. However, I had more of a few people just from time to time would coach. I would call it coach. They didn't walk me through everything. I never really had that, but they would provide opportunities. And, And a couple of those were men who were of my faith, who were very strong in my faith that that would just say, hey, you could do this. Would you, here's an assignment. Could you do this? Or, you know, and just those little like providing opportunities for me helped me see myself a little bit. And it just, they like opened the floodgates in terms of, so I've had a lot of coaches. So that's what I'm saying. But in terms of the connection between culture, and I'm a a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I really didn't have people that did what I was going to do. I, in fact, I really struggled with it. I, to be honest, I really, really struggled with it because I, I was raised very, very traditionally. Yet I just knew that I was supposed to get my education, that I was supposed to go back and get my education. I didn't think about working or whatever. I just knew I was supposed to get my education. And I saw a few people do that, but I knew for me that God wanted me to be prepared and I wasn't sure why. I had like, what's the word I should use? Permission in some ways to get my education, which I did. 
and I walked through that, but I did have a lot of criticism at me, like, why are you doing this, especially my master's and then my doctorate? So I had more criticism than role models, but I always knew profoundly within my heart because of spiritual things that that's what I needed to do. So I remember one day a woman just said at church, you know, how can you leave your little kids and and why would you need this? You're going to be a stay-at-home mom. And I just leaned in and I said, because God told me to. And that's kind of shut her up. But also, I just, I felt like I really, even when I was at BYU for a little bit right after my doctorate, and I could see women either working full time and they had kids at home or women working full time who didn't have kids. And I kind of wanted to do a combination. And there just weren't that many people that did what I, what I did. And it wasn't easy, by the way. It just, it wasn't easy. But all of us are made very differently. And even though I tried to fit in this box of what what I thought a really great mother would look like. I found that uh, I was made differently than most people. My mind was busy all the time. I really found joy. My heart would leap at organizing systems and processes, not necessarily uh, working with little kids in my church or anything, you know. And I finally got to the point where I just knew that I needed to embrace my talents and gifts and strengths and use them in ways that that I felt needed to be used. So I kind of didn't answer it directly, but uh, I don't know. That's that's my path. Everybody has different paths, but it's good. I think today there's a few, there's more people, especially as I look around in Utah and I'm connected to thousands of women here in Utah, there's more acceptance, I think, of different combinations. You know, even a full-time mom, maybe 10 hours a week she's working or doing this or that, this combination of things. So I tell people all the time, do what you feel is right. You know, if, if it's being home full-time, no work or a combination or get involved in the community, but and do things that make your heart and your mind leap, like your mind, what's what's on your mind first thing in the morning? What What's like the most interesting thing? <laughs> like you wake up and think, oh, I get to do this. What is that and then follow that there's there's something within your career especially getting getting all kinds of degrees uh you can do so many things with even even a degree in biology you can do many many things that are not even related to biology with that degree right so all, all education really prepares us to do so many professional things but also community things family things and and so forth man i'm all over the place no this is great well and susan i was i was just gonna thank you because i recognize we're talking about really personal things and so i, I really do appreciate you sharing this i think it's really great for um, our listeners just to hear a, a different perspective um and so so i really really appreciate you sharing these things thanks <laughs> In addition to that, I'll follow that up with a question, of course. <laughs> um, so another article that I was reading that you wrote, um, you're talking about raising girls to become leaders, and it kind of fits into this conversation of, okay, so maybe we're breaking the mold a little bit, but now we have this other generation of, of young women. And so one strategy that you suggest um, when teaching these girls is to have them reflect on their experiences. I know you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'd love for you to talk to us about you know, what are some simple strategies that students can use as a way to really reflect and, and then build confidence from that reflection and, and move forward in their careers. That's that's great. Uh, it, it really is a way I teach my students uh, this skill as well. It's really, I mean, people use the word reflecting a lot, but one of the things that that is key is, is it's deeper than most of the time. It's really deeper, but you can do that on the, you, usually you can't get to that depth while you're multitasking and doing a million things. But I always, when I used to drive a bunch, which I'm not driving that much anymore, I used to have my radio off in the car and do some reflection there, doing some reflection, other things. But one of the things with reflection that is key is this. Most people think that they learn from experience. 
right? And you would say, yeah, duh, that's true. But actually, it's not experiences that teach you. It's the reflection on the experiences that teach you. So two people can have maybe a really challenging experience, and one can go off and not learn a thing. And the other one, if you will let the reflection like go through, maybe it was a difficult, maybe somebody was really rude to you or something. If you will reflect and get the learning out of that, that's the key. If you try and answer analyze it, understand it. You don't want to wallow in it, right? Then you come out on top and you're saying, wow, I can learn this cool lesson from that. That is is the key to really developing leadership and helping our daughters or uh, I call it raising girls, but that could be elementary school teachers. It could be neighbors. It could be bigger sisters it could, or brothers. It could be fathers, you know, whoever it is. Um, that is. That is really a key. One of the things that I also talk about a lot before I get to confidence, though, is the importance of helping girls, and this is important for boys too, and young men and young women, to really keenly understand their gifts and their strengths. In the culture that we have here, oftentimes, especially for women, they think if they talk about their gifts and strengths, that they're actually not being, I'm putting my hands up for a quote mark, humble, and they're supposed to be humble. But Sometimes I say, just, you know, especially when they talk about that, I'm like, that's crap. Okay, humility just means being teachable. And you can be confident. You can talk about your gifts and strengths and be teachable at the same time. That's what humility. Humility doesn't mean being small. And women believe often that humility means being small. That means being humble, not talking about your gifts and strengths, not even acknowledging that. Marissa, I have to tell you, I've taught so many workshops where I ask women to turn to the person next to them and talk about their gifts and strengths, and it kills them. They cannot do it. They're like so uncomfortable. I'm like, just tell three. But they could give me pages of their weaknesses, pages of their weaknesses. But what we know is the more we understand our gifts and our strengths and our unique patterns, the way our brains work, the more we understand all of that, the more we can actually contribute to the world. We can contribute to our businesses. So it's a real gift when we understand who we are, how we're different, how we're unique, and every one of us is unique in different ways. And then that is really the core of developing your voice and your confidence. And, and so, hey, I worked in confidence to that last one. I, you, you asked me about confidence. I, I do a lot of teaching and work and speaking on uh, the differences between men and women on confidence and how important it is to help women strengthen and develop their confidence. And by the way, I always have to say that oftentimes people say, well, isn't that blaming women themselves for, you know, I say in terms of women and development and really making a bigger impact in society and in businesses today, we really do want to work with women, develop them, but also be working on those structures and processes and systems that really are built more masculine and disadvantaged women. So just putting it out there. <laughs> so many good things, so many nuggets, Susan, as you're, as you're chatting here. I, I really love this idea of humility, and I love this, I'm going to butcher what you said, but something along the lines of humility doesn't mean we have to be small. And again, I just I think that's so empowering, and oh, I, I'm learning so much. If nothing else, I know that Thank I'm getting you. a lot of this conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, when you take that confidence and or, or that confidence piece and that lack of leadership identity, and sometimes that being small kind of concept altogether, then, you know, we understand a little bit more why why girls and, and women struggle to be leaders and why people don't see them as leaders. But I, w I will tell you that most of it comes from socialization. So um, we're just socialized different. And I had a mayor last year. He said to me, I raised my daughters and sons exactly the same. And I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> he said it twice. I'm like, you can't. And uh, because because we do socialize. And one interesting little nugget, uh, Marissa, um, is some of the latest research that's been published is on socialization differences between girls and boys is about fathers and daughters. And that is fathers naturally really push their boys out there to learn how to take risks and to be rough, kind of just but uh, they protect their daughters so they don't give their daughters the 
chances they're overprotective. And so some of the research says at age three and four, girls are asking for help a lot more than boys are. Isn't that interesting? And which, oh. which means that starts taking her confidence down and some, some different things. So uh, we need to wrap this into your <laughs> college students, though. But even understanding, you know, how we're socialized different and really reflecting on our past back to that reflection question. The more we have an understanding of our past and how it is informed our voice and the decisions we make and why we might be hesitant about something, the more we understand that, the more we can actually make conscious decisions moving forward. Absolutely. And I, I think this is actually all really relevant, Susan, because so many of our students, whether they're at the Logan campus or a statewide campus, um, many of them are parents. And so I think these are really yeah. relevant conversations to bring up for several reasons. And I'm actually going to stay on this thread just a little bit longer because I really would love to know, you know, as a mother of four children, what do you hope you've taught them about careers and, and this idea of building confidence? So I have one daughter and, and three sons, and they're all between like 25 and 34 now. So they're, they're a bit older. But one of the things I hope I've taught them, and they're all pretty self, self you know, um, independent, I should say, self-reliant, is how to work hard and how to really take responsibility for your actions. I think my kids have some good confidence. My daughter, by the way, um, joined the National Guard, so she's my soldier. So she she shot, shoots guns and stuff like that. <laughs> but my favorite thing right now is uh, she has a 20, 20 month old daughter. So <laughs> I oh. have a granddaughter and, and a grandson as well. So I really hope that I taught them, and and I think they do, is to explore their gifts and their strengths and how and how their mind worked and what careers, what majors in college, even if it was outside the box a little bit, right? I had a lot of conversations with my daughter about what, you know, when she would say, well, I should do this. I'm, I'm like, well, should. Let's back out of that word a little bit. Maybe you don't see other women doing certain things, but what feels right to you? What, what you know, understanding your shanks and your gifts, what what area seems most most helpful or makes your heart, I've used that a lot, makes your heart and mind kind of leap in joyous ways. So I think uh, we all struggle still with confidence in certain ways. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I, I hope that they have developed more of a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset. A growth mindset meaning it's really based on effort. So if I work hard, so my, my kids are hard workers. If I work hard, I can learn this. I can I can learn this new concept. I can learn this new skill. I can learn this new behavior. There's that hope that we're just not on earth to just be who we were born. And, and you know, we can't be more intelligent or whatever. But there's some real possibilities for us to shift and learn and, and become who we want to become to impact other people. Love those, love those thoughts and, and insights. And I think, again, they're so relevant to, to our students. So I really appreciate you sharing them. I know we're, we're running short on time, so we'll, we'll start to wrap things up here just a little bit. But I do want to ask a question that's a little bit personal as well. I guess all of my questions I feel like today have been <laughs> incredibly personal. But I'd love to hear about some of your biggest life cheerleaders as you have embarked on this journey of developing a career. So talk to us about some meaningful people. Well, my husband's been really supportive of things and, and he, you know, he knew from the start that, you know, I had a lot of ambition and different things and I've struggled more with myself than he's struggled with any of my choices. So he's been always encouraging that whatever you decide, you know, then you should do it. So he's been great. I also have been really blessed with, especially my early career, you know, about 20 years ago at uh, 18, at Utah Valley University, I actually, early on those first couple of years I was there, I had three men in my life who were my leaders on campus. One was my dean, his name was Jim, Jim Fenton. And then another one was the president of UVU, Bill Cedarberg. And then another one was the provost to Brad Cook. And I actually just chatted with Brad yesterday. He's the president of Snow College now. Anyway, all of them in those first couple of years, they just knew I could do stuff <laughs> and they could see me, you know, they 
I was a go-getter and I, I didn't realize I was exceptional at certain things that I did. I thought everybody could do though. And, and that's not uncommon. A lot of women, especially, but all of us think, oh, this thing that I do, everybody probably does it. But then we realize maybe not. Anyway, they all, they didn't sit and mentor me that much. They just opened the doors. They just said, hey, here's an assignment. You just, you know, do it. And they wouldn't sit there and say, oh, you did such a great job. What they did was just, now can you do that? Now can you do that? <laughs> so they just gave me opportunities to do things that I felt that I loved. And I will say, so I don't picture them sitting on the side being cheerleaders in the more traditional sense. But I think that they were in terms of just smiling inside, finding joy that I was succeeding and really doing that. So th that was early in my career, but I've had other people as well that just really have um, just through emails from time to time, watching you, thank you for your work, doing great. Those kinds of things have really kind of kept me going through the years uh, and I have some deep internal motivation as well. So I think those those folks I do is particularly one of my brothers, uh, Tim. Wilden is his name. He has been a major cheerleader. He he got got me. He's 10 years younger, but we played racquetball like once a week for 10 years. And every time he would just he would just lift me. He's just such a good person and just cheer me on. Just say, go do it. You should do it. No, you can do this. You can do that. So I've been fortunate. And most of them, Marissa, have been men. Not interesting. Men can be powerful influences on girls and young women and women. Absolutely. And, and I love you bringing that kind of full circle. Susan, I feel like there's probably 50 follow-up questions I could ask you right now, and I would be very content. Um, but I know that we certainly don't have time for that today. But I do want to close just with one final question. And that question is, if you could give one piece of advice to listeners about building career confidence, what would it be? Great, great final question. I really do, especially for students here, uh, but for anyone listening in, I am such a proponent of going to college, staying in college, finishing college degrees, and continuing into graduate degrees. I early on studied the research on the meaningfulness and what it does to develop who you are, your mind, your skills, your confidence, your self-esteem. And there's so many studies that have really connected those, that perseverance in getting your degrees with all kinds of benefits. Even community work, more educated people are more engaged. They vote more. They lead in the community. They serve in in more prominent ways, parenting benefits, more educated people read more often to their kids, so many things. So as we're preparing for careers or upping our careers or strengthening ourselves, that formal education is, I've just seen way, I'm talking hundreds if not thousands of studies that connect that formal education, closing the loop on those degrees, that bachelor's and then that master's degree to really link to life satisfaction, good mental health, all kinds of things. And for me, helping people prepare to positively influence in society and in their businesses and in their companies and in their homes and families is the most important thing. And a formal education can help students and anyone do that. Well, Susan, I, I so appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. Again, I, I wish we had a couple more hours, but I, I cherish the time that we've had and, and I know our students will benefit from it as well. So thank you so much for being here with us. Good to get to know you, Marissa. To learn more about Susan's work, visit www.utwomen.org. Thanks for joining us here at the Career Studio today. Please remember to join us next week as we continue to discuss this month's theme of building career confidence.